Hello. So evolutionary inference based on comparison of functional features encoded in present-day genomes is a key approach to comparative genomics. And typically, this approach requires the identification of homologs or orthologs across species, which in itself is a very difficult problem. In the work I'm going to describe today, um, we tried a different approach. So instead of focusing on gene families, we focus instead on domain families, um, which are the basic functional modules of proteins. So a domain is a sequence fragment that encodes a distinct fold and has a characteristic function. And I have an example here. Uh, so in this protein here, we <laughs> Um, I'm showing the structure of the protein and its corresponding sequence. And this protein has uh, three distinct domains shown in purple, red, and green, uh, with the correspondence, corresponding sequence highlighted in the same color. Now the series of domains in a protein is often referred to as its domain architecture and depicted in a cartoon like this one here. So one of the key properties of a protein domain is that the sequence will fold into the characteristic structure um, in many different contexts. And because of this property, they act as module, modular building blocks that combine in different ways to produce varied protein uh, functions. And we can represent the genomic domain content uh, by a table like this one here. Uh, which shows the domain families uh, encoded in the present-day genomes, as well as the copy numbers of each of those domains. And this table provides a measure of the protein function potential encoded in the genomes without requiring gene or ortholog prediction. Now, various uh, mechanisms of protein innovation influence the protein coding potential of the genomes. For example, if we have a gene duplication event, as here, um, the abundance of each of the domains encoded in that gene will be increased by one. Protein novelty can also arise through novel combinations of pre-existing domains, for example, here, uh, which also increases the abundance of those domains. And we also see novelty arising through the ac uh, acquisition of new domains, uh, either alone or in combination with domains that are already present in the genome. And all of these processes of protein innovation are reflected in the genomic copy number represented in this table here. So in this work, we were interested in investigating the evolution of the domain toolkit encoded in these metazoan genomes. Uh, so here we have the species tree with down at the bottom, we have two outgroup coanoflagellate uh, species, as well as early branching metazoas, such as the sponge, and up here, the jellyfish. While at the top, we have the very familiar vertebrate species. And we also need a table like this one containing the genomic domain content. And to get this table, we use the superfamily database. And for this metazoan uh, species tree here, the table has 21 rows and approximately 1,300 columns. This shows a summary of that metazoan domain content that we obtained from superfamily. So in the bar graph, what I'm showing you here is for each genome uh, is the percentage of those uh, 1,300 domain families that are either absent in white, uh, present uh, in a single copy in light blue, or present with multiple copies in dark blue. And then given the domain content uh, of present-day genomes from that table, we use a birth, death, and gain model to infer uh, rates of domain gain, duplication, and loss, uh, the domain families that are encoded in ancestral genomes, as well as the domain families that were either gained or lost on each branch of the species tree. Uh, and to do this analysis, we use the COUNT software package, which implements a probabilistic model of discrete characters on a tree. To hear about rates of change, come see us at poster K53. So what did the ancestral genome, uh, the domain content, look like? Well, here's the inferred domain content of the ancestral genomes uh, highlighted along this backbone here. And as before, I'm showing the percentage of those 
1,300 domain families that are present in one copy or present in with more than one copy. And as you can see, we infer gradual uh, but steady growth in both of these entities, at least along the backbone here. However, this shows the number and the size of the families, but not which specific families are represented in the genome. For example, are the families in light blue up here the same as the families in light blue here, right? It's possible that some families were gained while others were lost, suggesting a very different evolutionary strategy than just steady growth. And to investigate this question, we can look at the change in domain content along each branch of the species tree. So here's, I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of how I'll represent these results. For each branch of the species tree, we inferred the number of families that went from absent to present, uh, shown in green to the right, as well as the number of families that went from present to absent, shown as a red bar on the left. And then I'll uh, represent the net change as a solid bar with the color of which direction it went in. Similarly, the number of families that went from having one copy to having multiple copies is going to be shown in this light green to the right, and the number of families that contracted from having many copies to only one copy will be shown in pink. So here are the results for all the branches in the metazoan tree, with family gains and losses uh, are going to be on the left side, and then expansion and contractions are on the right side. This is a lot of data to look at at once, so I'm going to break it down for you uh, by showing how these uh, changes can be fall into four evolutionary patterns. So for some branches, uh, as highlighted here in green, we infer gain of new families as well as expansion of existing families. And this is consistent with what we saw before with gradual growth and expansion. Um, however, we also observe patterns that are consistent with more dramatic changes. So on these branches in purple, we're seeing um, loss of domain families. And then uh, the families that weren't lost are being expanded in copy number. In the third case, we observe fairly balanced gain and loss of families, uh, and then the families that are not lost are expanding in copy number. And finally, we observe streamlining where families are being lost, and the remaining families are also contracting. So in conclusion, what we uh, see here is for ancestral toolkits, in general, we observe gradual toolkit growth and expansion, followed by stabilization. Uh, we also observe dynamic change in the set of families encoded in the genome, and these changes uh, reflect a small number of evolutionary strategies. So on uh, ancestral branches, we tended to observe genome expansion and genome turnover, while on branches uh, to leaves, we observe specialization, streamlining, and turnover. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, everyone in the Duran Lab, especially Yu Ting Zhao, who helped a lot with this work. And I'd also like to thank Miklos Suros, who uh, is the creator of the Count so uh, software. And finally, come see us at K53 to talk about rates of domain evolution in Metazoa. No, let me, uh, so what's the difference use the uh, super family and P5 moon is something like a, that? Um, they're very similar. Um, oftentimes they overlap. The super family database is um, built on top of the CAF um, structure database and then mm -hmm. makes this, uh, uh, sorry, sequence HMM models for each of those uh, domain uh, structures. Okay, thanks. Thank you.